<laughs> hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host, CJ. Now, just before the new year, I posted a video about this, the new M1 Mac Mini. Not this exact Mac Mini, an identical model, but a different Mac Mini. I returned that Mac because, well, it just didn't work. So, I guess if you haven't seen that video, I just gave away the ending, but if you wanna see how it failed and all the steps I went through to try to make it work, feel free to check it out. However, more spoilers, by the end of the week, because just a little behind the scenes of that video, I edited it all together so it looked like I did it all in like an evening. But in reality, the gap between first trying to set up the computer and when I did the first OS reinstall was a full week. A week when I researched the problem and potential solutions, I emailed Apple Media Relations for any info or comment on the problem, but I didn't get a response. I called Apple support, but the automated system, despite recognizing the proper serial number, couldn't locate the serial number, so therefore wouldn't give me the option to talk to a human being. I tried to make a service appointment, but there was nothing available. Now, in fairness, there is only one Apple store in my entire city, and dude, they have very limited appointments available, and I just wasn't able to get one. I talked to some Mac users I know who actually told me to just factory reset the system, which in actuality was the worst advice possible, but I'll get into that. In the end, I just gave up, which you have no idea how hard it is for me to do, but ultimately I just couldn't find a solution to the problem, and despite many viewers chiming in with some good guesses in the comments, none of them had the answer either. Ultimately, the big problem was I spent $700 on a new computer, brought it home, and couldn't get it to work, so yeah, I was a little angry, and it showed, but it's been a few weeks, I'm over it, and I'm not gonna let one bad experience ruin the plans I had for this system. I mean, if I did that, I wouldn't be able to cover any products from pretty much any company. So I bought a new one, I ordered this one directly from Apple and picked it up the next day, well, actually two days later because I was busy the next day, but the point is, these are still available to buy at MSRP, and most PC stuff isn't. So I'm gonna take you through successfully setting up the Mac Mini, but first, let me explain what the problem was with the first one, because even though I couldn't figure it out and pretty much nobody who watched the video could figure it out, when I picked up this Mac from the Apple store, I asked the Apple genius guy there, and he knew exactly what the problem was. Apparently, all the M1 Macs, not just the Mini, the MacBooks too, had a problem in the firmware which broke some things most notably the Mac OS recovery functions. Now, in most cases, this problem wasn't noticeable and the Mac set up and ran just fine. But if for some reason you wiped the system and reinstalled Mac OS, you'd be greeted with the exact same problem I ran into. So basically, if you haven't updated your Mac mini yet to Big Sur 11.1, you should. Now, initially, I didn't reset the Mac. I just tried to set it up right out of the box so basically what I was told was this happened with several, he didn't define several, but several Mac M1 systems. He speculated that what probably happened with these systems is that during the QA process, there was some other error detected, which led to a system reset, which like I demonstrated, appears to go just fine until you try to set the system up. So first, update your system, but if you do run into the problem, the guy said that they had them in stock, they were just exchanging them for brand new systems in most cases. Now, if you are a power user and have another Mac, you can use the Apple Configurator 2, which has the ability to update the firmware, or there is an Apple support doc, I'll put a link in the description, that'll take you through the process of correcting it through, well, many commands you need to type precisely into the terminal in a specific sequence. I'm not recommending that, I'm just saying it can apparently be done. Okay, that whole experience, that's behind me. Let's go over the future, why I bought another one, what my plans are for, and who's the target audience? I guess I should start with the target audience, and 
That's PC users, not all PC users, just the PC users who either A, saw all the hype around these M1 Macs and are thinking about making the switch, or B, need a new computer but can't find an affordable PC or the parts to build a new PC. It's bad right now. Even the parts for like the $250 home office PC build guide or the $500 compact office PC build videos I did are hit and miss at the moment. Pre-built PC prices are starting to get a bit out of hand and the good companies that actually charge MSRP have a bit longer wait times for a new system. But this, depending where you are, I guess, you can probably pick up today. I don't hold grudges, so I bought another one to get back to my original plan. Me, a complete Mac novice, a noob, I'm gonna do all the workflow I would normally do on my production workstation PC on the Mac mini, and I'm gonna take y'all along for the ride. So this isn't a traditional review per se. I'm not gonna run a bunch of benchmarks or highlight a bunch of Mac specific software that I don't know how to use. There are a ton of those reviews out there, a lot of really, really good ones, but they're almost entirely done by experienced Mac users. So when they say something like, this Mac M1 mini outperforms my $3,000 2018 MacBook or my $5,000 2019 iMac. I don't know what that means. I mean, I get the price point, but I don't have a frame of reference for the performance comparison. But if I say, for example, this thing performs like a Ryzen 5 3600 RTX 2070 equivalent PC, you probably get it. So today we're gonna start with successfully setting up the Mac. Spoiler, this one works. It's actually back there running right now. Then. I'm gonna install all the software I use on the Mac. I actually have a couple hours of footage that I'll try to edit down to a digestible level. I'll probably skim through the software installation after the first one because it all worked pretty much the same way, but this is also about taking you along for the Mac experience from a PC user's point of view. There'll be chapter markers below, feel free to skip around and. I'll be back at the end to highlight my first impressions of the Mac Mini, some of the problems I encountered, and some of the little quirks of using a Mac, and my initial impressions of the M1 Mac Mini. Then, finally, I'll let you know what my future plans are for the system. Hey, as far as actually installation, it's pretty easy. I have power internet okay this is a thunderport cable for my second monitor an hdmi for the first monitor and then finally is my mouse and keyboard which will go in the usb port and that is it all right let's get it powered up and hopefully set up into the operating system Okay, now here, if you want to migrate information from your Windows PC, you can do that. I'm just setting this up as a completely clean install. All right here, if you do have an Apple ID, you can utilize the Apple ID you already have. I'm gonna go at this like I've never had an Apple ID and until just a few weeks ago, I didn't. So I'm gonna create a completely new one. All right, these, this is all blurred out because it's personally identifiable information, but it's all pretty self-explanatory. All right, also while you're setting up, you wanna make sure you have your phone handy because there is ID verification to get your Apple ID set up and there's you can't skip that, so you'll need to make sure your phone's handy because they'll send you a text with a code. All right. Fingers crossed. Now I'm just using the, the default information that they've given me, that they've suggested. The only one rule that I, that I really know of here is that your name, your account name, has to be separate from that Apple ID name that you just created. Woohoo! 
<laughs> you, if you if you didn't see the last video, you you have no idea. Don't need that. As a brand new Mac user, I can definitely see Siri being extremely helpful. So we'll enable her. No. Oh, definitely dark. Oh yeah. Your keyboard cannot be usable until it's identified, okay? This is a Windows keyboard, and I, I did make sure to ask before I bought it that a Windows keyboard will work with Mac, but you might have to go through this step. So press the key immediately to the right of the shift key. So I guess for me, that is the Z key. And to the left of the right side. Okay, so that is the question mark. And yes, that's what it is. It's the United States keyboard, so it identified it. Okay, and now, finally, it looks like I'm in the Mac desktop. Oh, but, okay, I'll pull back to show you. Okay, so I guess the first thing I have to solve, my top monitor is actually mounted up here upside down, so I have to flip the display, the top display, and again, I am a complete noob to Mac, but I have been reading up on it, so... I should be able to find this in here. Um, displays, okay, and all right. So here's just a pro tip for you. When you're working with a display, now I have to rotate this display that's already upside down. That means all my mouse movements are inverted. So to be able to easily do this, just flip your mouse upside down and then just use your thumb to click and now I can actually move and I want to change to 180 degrees. Should do it. S. And now flip my mouse the right way and confirm. Now down on my main display, it still has me set up as side by side. So I guess I can go here to arrangement. Yeah, okay. So this is my bottom display and that's my top display. So move that there all right that's it so that was pretty easy to set my displays up so now i have top and bottom display and my little close buttons are on this side okay okay guys we're set up now so let me just quickly go over how i have this all set up so the desktop itself the mac desktop my audio even the desktop audio plus the webcam footage is all being captured with my main production PC. So there's no software capture of the Mac itself. It's all completely being captured externally. So as I go through everything and actually test the system, see how it works, I don't have to worry about any of the resources being dedicated to capturing desktop video. Uh, as far as continuing to set up, so the next thing I'm going to do is set up my external drive. So just as a recap, this is a one terabyte NVMe M.2 SSD that I have in a Thunderbolt 3 certified external case. So we're going to I'm going to plug that in right now and see if I can get it set up on the Mac itself, because it'll be the first time I've actually set up an external drive on a Mac plugged in okay your okay your disk was attached not readable by the computer well let's initialize okay. external yep that's the one i'm looking for capacity one terabyte uninitialized it is completely blank like it's out of the box copy a volume or restore a disk image don't want to do that Oh, erase and reformat the selected volume. Yep, I want to do that, I think. Okay. So the APSF is the Mac format, but I want to be able to swap this back and forth to get assets that I'll need off my main PC because as I do video editing, all my audio files and, and stock footage and all that is 
on my main PC and I'm gonna wanna swap files back and forth. So I think the one to go with is XFAT here. We'll call this Mac external. And see if that works. Time to continue. And it looks like I have a initialized and ready to go disk. Oh, not downloads. This is the whole bear with me part when I figure out file. File? Let's find it. Here we go. Aha, Mac external. Should be nothing there. New folder. Okay. That's an assets folder I just created real quick. So that's assets I can bring over from my main PC to here. Okay, so for all intents and purposes, I think that worked out pretty well. So task two completed, not bad. All right, now that I got everything set up and it seems like it's running pretty good, I have to start installing the software that I'm gonna need onto the system. So there's a lot that I'm gonna install and there's a lot that I'm gonna go over and test uh, over the next uh, probably few weeks. I uh, don't remember everything off the top of my head. I'll throw a list up here somewhere. But the first thing I know I do need is DaVinci Resolve. And DaVinci Resolve is my editor of choice. I may do some testing in Premiere Pro, but I know there's already a lot of testing on the M1 Mac Mini using Premiere Pro. So I may skip it because it's not an application I use a lot, but I am going to use DaVinci Resolve because that's my video editing daily workflow. And I guess it has been optimized for the M1 Mac Mini. So I'm going to go ahead and find that. All right. So open up Safari and I want the 17.1. And that should be the Mac M1 optimized version okay yeah that is it download here we go all right so over here right you see we have a couple we have davinci resolve 17 public beta the 17 public beta should be the mac os x windows and linux and then when we get to 17.1 this is the you can see here it's mac running apple m1 processors and is compatible with mac os big sur so that is the one i want to download oh i want and i'm going to use davinci resolve studio because i i have a license for it if you just want to try out davinci resolve the davinci resolve itself is is a free application for non-commercial use I'm going to go with the studio version. Oh, I have to go find my serial number. Okay, I'll get back to this. Okay, so it downloaded. It's right here. I can press this little button, I guess. Open it up in Finder. And there it is. So, open. I'm going to install it. Yep, install that. So just for note, I'm installing all software packages on the internal SSD itself, not on that external drive. I'm not even sure if that's a uh, option, but Mac sure wants your password a lot. You wanna keep the installer. Nope, wanna move to trash. So I'm a complete Mac noob, but I am very familiar with Linux and Linux based operating system. So I know that this launch pad is pretty much identical to something like an Ubuntu app launcher. So once you install an app or some software package on the Mac, that is where you should find it. And here it is right here. So let me just go ahead and start this up, make sure it starts up before I move on to the rest of the software. Now my media location that this is one of the reasons I use that external drive. I only have a 256 gigabyte hard drive in this. So I'm not going to load that up with all my project and media data for any of my workflow, especially video editing. 
because one 20 minute YouTube video can use 80 plus gigabytes of raw footage. So I'm going to see if I can uh, move this to the external Mac external. Let's see, I need to make a new folder. There you go. How do I do that? Let's go to Okay. Looks like it's working well, just like I would expect it. Now I'm going to just drive on and continue to install all the software that I need. So bottom line up front, everything went well. I did run into one little issue with my setup. So in order to screen cap the Mac, I have it connected and passed through the Avermedia 4K capture card in my workstation. Now, at first I couldn't get a video display either in the PC capture software or pass through to the monitor. So how I had the Mac set up is the Mac HDMI out was connected to an HDMI wall keystone outlet with a four foot high speed HDMI cable. In the wall, there's a 15 foot fiber optic HDMI cable that runs to another HDMI wall keystone outlet on this side of the room. That side is then connected to the input of the capture card with a four foot high speed HDMI cable. Then the output goes back to the monitor the same exact way. Now, in fairness, that's like 46 feet of cable to drive a signal through, which is a tall order for any source to manage, but 30 feet of that is fiber, so there's practically no signal degradation or resistance there. So that's only like eight feet of copper from the Mac to the PC, so that shouldn't be a problem, but even when I pulled the output, I still couldn't get a signal to the PC only. Now, to fix the issue, I just moved the Mac from over here to over here next to my workstation and just have one four foot HDMI cable into the capture card and one four foot back to the monitor. This is working just fine. I'm not exactly sure what the problem was. The Mac mini is a very low power unit. In fact, at idle, this one pulls just like eight watts, but considering HDMI 2.0 peak power draw is something like five watts my guess and this is only a guess but i think the power allotment for the hdmi port is reduced so the cable length you can use is limited typically with hdmi 2.0 you can go with max cable lengths up to 25 to 35 feet before you start to hit signal loss i think for this mac it's considerably less now i imagine four to six feet is all the typical user would need I have a bunch of HDMI cables of various lengths I can test, so I'll do some follow-up testing because there are situations where you may want or need a display device farther away. As far as other issues, I heard there was an issue using streaming services like Netflix on the M1 Mac, so I logged into my Netflix account and tried it. Yeah, I couldn't use it. I just got a message saying my display wasn't HDCP compliant, but it definitely is. And yes, I disconnected the capture card and connected the Mac directly to the display before I tried. I have other monitors, so I'll follow up on that too. Moving on to the little things that a PC user will take some getting used to on a Mac. Now, you can use a Windows keyboard and mouse with a Mac. So if you already have one, there isn't really a need to buy a Mac version, but there are some things that are different. First. If you use the scroll wheel on the mouse to, well, <laughs> scroll, on the Mac, it's opposite. And I can kind of see the logic there because it acts like a touch screen. So when you scroll up, you're actually moving the page up. And when you scroll down, the 
page moves down. So it's logical. It's just sometimes frustrating when you're like, oh yeah, okay. There is a setting to change this if you really want to though. Now for the keyboard, I haven't figured out all the differences with it, but obviously a Windows keyboard has a Windows key that is now the Apple command key, which I discovered is used in several ways, one being hotkeys. So if you're used to hitting control C or control V, now it's command C and command V. So that key you trained yourself not to hit on accident, well, now you need to use it. Right click copy, right click paste, still works though. The only other weird thing I noticed in the couple hours of use so far is that every time I installed the program, it left the virtual drive icon on the desktop. So from what I can tell, Mac operates more like Linux than it does Windows, which makes sense since they were both birthed from Unix. So the software installation file is a, a disk image, the PC equivalent of an ISO file. So when you initialize the file, it's like you're mounting that to a virtual drive. And every time I did that, Mac OS added a link to that virtual drive to the desktop that remained even after the installation was complete and I deleted the downloaded installation files. So those icons left behind aren't icons to launch the app, they launch the installation. So once the installation is complete, just delete them or your desktop can get cluttered pretty quickly. Other than that, the Mac OS is pretty much as advertised. It's intuitive and not like completely foreign to a PC user like me. However, I probably have a bit of an edge over a strict Windows user because I'm very familiar with Linux. I'm running Ubuntu on a couple of my lower spec PCs right now. Like I said, Mac OS and Linux are both based on Unix. It's the, the Berkeley licensed version back from like the 60s and 70s, I'm pretty sure. Mac developed it into a completely locked down operating system while Linux went in the open source direction. But with some patience in Google, the learning curve for a Windows user shouldn't be too difficult. In fact, one very positive feature was the ease of the networking. I have 40 terabytes of RAID storage in my workstation that's set up as a windowed share drive also. On the Mac, I just open the network folder in the finder and all the PCs that were connected to my home network showed up. I just clicked on my workstation, logged in with my Windows info and had access to the shared storage. So the whole using the external drive to transfer assets back and forth isn't even necessary now. As far as my first impressions of the Mac mini itself, well, it's pretty much as advertised. It's very responsive, apps launch quickly, all the software installed without any apparent issues. The computer itself, well, you just forget it's even there. It's cool, silent, it sips power. I think 18 watts is the max I've seen it draw from the wall so far. Despite my first experience, I have no complaints so far, but then again, I haven't really put the system to work. That's where this series is going. I can't really sum up the Mac Mini in a few hours of use like I can with a PC. I can build a PC in a few hours of using it. I can pretty much determine its strengths and weaknesses based on years of experience. I don't have that experience with Mac, so I'm going to try to gain some as I use the system for a while, and I'll take you along with me. So the plan is to actually use all the software I just installed in my regular workflow. I'll record the experience and share it here on the channel. It'll probably be, I don't know, three or four videos that as long as I don't run into any problems, I should be able to upload every few days. In the end, I'll sum up everything and with the goal of giving the target audience a recommendation for or against the M1 Mac Mini as a viable alternative to a new PC. The criteria are the same as always, price to performance. If this performs to or outperforms a similarly priced PC, well then it's a winner. If not, then we can look at some other alternatives maybe. Also, I need to determine if I can do everything I do on my PC on this Mac. But that's pretty much it. If y'all wanna check out the series as well as all the regular content I'll still be publishing every Sunday, be sure to subscribe. If you have any questions, be sure to ask in the comments. The benefit of being a smaller channel is I 
can still respond to pretty much all the comments. Hope to see you in the next one, guys. Until then, stay safe.